Well, good afternoon. We're continuing on with the commentary of the first Corinthians. And today we're in chapter two. And Paul proclaims and declares his method of teaching. And I, brothers, when I came to you, came out not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not like enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and the power. Notice here that Paul clearly separates the demonstration of the spirit of the spirit from the demonstration of the power. He says they are two things. So that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect. Yet not the wisdom of the world, not this world, nor the princes of this world that come to nothing. Remember, Satan is a prince of the air. He's a prince of this world. And he doesn't know anything except that he's going to end up in hell. He's trying to put that up as long as he can. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, which God ordained before the world unto our glory. God had this plan all sorted out even before the world was created, which none of the princes of this world knew or understood. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, Eyes have not seen, nor ears heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that love him. God's got a plan and purpose for every one of us, and it's good. And, and it was all written down for us. But God has revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Nobody can look at you and work out what you're thinking. Only the spirit of man which is in you can do that. Even so, the things of God know no man but the spirit of God. Now, we have received not the spirit of the world, which is the demonic spirits, but the spirit which is of God, which is pure and holy, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak of, not in the words that man's wisdom teaches, but which is which the Holy Ghost teaches. Remember in Jeremiah 31, 32, it says, uh, in the new covenant, the Holy Spirit will become your teacher. He will teach us. And that Holy Spirit teaches comparing things spiritual with other things spiritual. So you can discern one against the other. And discern which is the Spirit of God and which is the Spirit of the Antichrist. But the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. You go to some tribe in the Amazon or some place that's never heard about the gospel, and you tell them about Jesus being hung on a cross because God loves them, and then that he died and they put him in a, a tomb, and then three days later he got up and walked around they would be scratching your heads and think you've been out in the sun too long. It doesn't make any sense to a person who doesn't know. For they are, neither can they, he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judges all things against the written word, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who has known the mind of the Lord? that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. And so, 
Paul is asking some pretty deep questions here. Who among you knows the mind of God and to tell him that he's making a mistake? Nobody. Although there's a very good part in Exodus where God says to Moses after after he'd come down off the mountain and smashed the first lot of tablets because the nation had made the calf and they had defiled God, worshipping other gods. And he says, I'm going to destroy this whole nation and start again with you. And Moses says, well, look, God, you can't really do that because everybody knew that you were going to take the people out of Egypt you brought them across the Red Sea. They've been sitting in the wilderness now for 40 years. Well, you didn't know that at the time, but we're sitting here in the wilderness because you have promised you're going to take us into the promised land. Now, if you destroy us all now, before we get into the promised land, all the nations around here will say you didn't have the power to do what you promised. And that's not going to look good on your copy book, on your CV, is it, God? And so it says, and God relented of the decision to destroy the nation and instead said, right, well, you're going to spend 40 years in the desert until this generation that was above 80 years, sorry, above 20 years old when you come out of Egypt have all died. And then in his mercy, he allowed two of the princes to stay alive because they had faith in God that he would be able to take them in the promised land. And you read about that when the 12 spies come back from looking into all the places where God's promised to be the promised land. 10 come back in unison. Yeah, they're all saying, we can't do it, we can't do it, we can't do it. But Joshua and Caleb said, God said we can do it. God has promised this land to Abraham and his descendants. If God says it, it's going to happen. That's the end of it. No more discussion. So those two were able to stay and, and enter into the, the promised land. The other ten who were saying things against God's word, they died the same night. You might be surprised to find that out, but go back and check it in, in the book of Exodus. They died the same night because they were saying that God's, it was impossible for God to do this. So, something to think about. Chapter 3 continues. Jesus Christ is the one and only foundation. All other foundations will crumble. But we'll look at that in, this, in the next session.